Awo oro ti omu Awo oni duro she eru ki she oro The wealth that enslaves the owner is not wealth This is the Yoruba proverb my proud Nigerian father would tell me every Monday before giving me my allowance I would look at the 1000 naira note in his hand, nod absent-mindedly, and think of all the ways I was going to spend it. For those of you unfamiliar with Nigerian currency, 1000 naira is equivalent to about $2.17. So my options were very limited. But I never really understood exactly what he was trying to say until 2008. When I was old enough to understand the World Bank's development assistance report and economist Dambisa Moyo published Dead Aid. 300 billion dollars. That's billion with a B. A little bit more than 1000 naira. That's the amount of money that has washed over the African continent. since 1970 in some form of development assistance like aid or charity 300 billion dollars that have bypassed the people that needed it the most while at times lining the pockets of others 300 billion dollars somewhere on the african continent but with very little to show for it You see my favorite part of growing up as the daughter of two diplomats besides very fast airport security was the constant inconsistency of setting. I've been to some pretty unpredictable places in the most unpredictable of times. I was in Kenya during some of the worst post-election violence in 2008. I was in Ethiopia when they celebrated the millennium 7 years after everyone else. I was in uh, Benin and Togo during the Ebola outbreak that ravaged Western Africa. And I uh, was a toddler in Uganda during the Rwandan genocide when the entire continent saw a mass exodus like they haven't seen in recent history. But the single recurring character and the story of my life has been Africa. I love that continent with every fiber of my being. Its beauty, its heterogeneity and its nuances, they've always enraptured me. And you get used to the mosquitoes at one point or another. But I had no idea that the subject of Africa has a completely different connotation outside of the continent. This first dawned on me when I went to summer camp for the very first time in the United States and I was immediately pummeled with questions once they found out where I'd come from. I was asked about the height of giraffes, about the size of my mud hut, why I'm wearing shoes. That was a weird one. And if elephants were the African equivalent of school buses. But the most shocking was when a girl came up to me and asked me or told me really that her family gave $100 every year to Africa and that I should be grateful because she was saving the country. Besides the common misconception that Africa is a single country, what she told me actually started me on a journey of understanding just how systemic the model around aid is and the sense of hierarchy that's partnered with it. You see it's been 70 years of the same model built solely out of pity. And with 45 billion dollars now funneling into the continent annually, if you do some investigating, the number of people actually living on a single dollar a day has increased drastically. There has to be something wrong with a system that has pushed countries to default on a trillion dollar loans cause a lack of government accountability compromise the very idea of democracy and cultivated a space for rampant corruption 
With all these negative effects due to a problem so ingrained in our global psyche, you'd actually be surprised that the solution is not as radical as you think if we all engage in it together. Now I must disclose, I am not an economist, nor am I an anthropologist or a historian, and God knows I am not a politician. I'm just a girl who grew up in a couple of super cushy suburbs across Sub-Saharan Africa who has seen way too much to not say anything. I've seen as how the simple donation of clothing into African countries has ruined the local textile industry because would you buy clothes when you can get them for free? I've sat back and witnessed as NGOs brought in mosquito nets into a small city in Tanzania, which ended up hurting the local economy because Tanzanians were already producing and selling their own mosquito nets, but weren't able to compete with the ultra low prices of handouts. You see, the problem lies in the mutually destructive idea of charity when it's coupled with no sense of accountability. The African people have lost their voice and the practice of democracy has metamorphosized into this ugly yet tameable beast. You see, in these transactions between governments, money is traveling with no strings attached, meaning that the government has no reason to use the money to benefit their own people. And without a proper system of checks and balances, citizens are left wondering exactly what rights are beholden to them. Because when a country depends so much on aid, the government has no real reason to set up a proper system of taxation because the money is already coming from somewhere else. And while we would all love to live in a world where we didn't have to pay taxes, we then lose the power to hold our government accountable to provide us with crucial things such as healthcare, public ed education, and just basic infrastructure. Think of it this way. Remember the uh, 1,000 Naira my father gave me every Monday? Growing up, I became dependent on that constant stream of money because it was coming every week like clockwork. My supply would be renewed regardless. And the way I spent it was never dictated. In addition to the fact that I didn't even work for it and I didn't earn the money, meant that I lost the understanding for the value of the dollar, or the Naira in my case. And because of that, I spent it quickly and on things I definitely didn't need. This is why insouciance is prevalent amongst African policymakers. Because with aid, there lacks an impetus to find other more viable ways of financing their country's long-term progress. Aid is the wolf in sheep's clothing. It's really modern day colonialism when you think about it because it has shackled the entire continent to development assistance. <clears throat> really, the end of colonies in the continent didn't necessarily liberate African countries to set their own agenda because colonialism was traded with charity. To disrupt this cycle, money has to be used as an investment. People rarely realize that Africa is filled with entrepreneurs who understand the issues in their own backyards and are creating innovative answers to the questions of Africans. It's not all giraffes and tigers and benefit concerts headlined by Bono. It's so much more. A biomedical smart jacket was invented in Uganda that has the ability to diagnose pneumonia four times faster than a doctor. In South Africa, they're in the process of building the world's largest telescope. Kenya is making its headway in the car industry by creating a cost-effective luxury SUV that can withstand the rough terrain of Kenyan roads. And Woe Labs, 
a startup in Togo, one of the world's poorest countries, created the first made in Africa 3D printer completely from e-waste. This list alone could be its own TED talk. And not to blow your minds, but Africa is a good investment. With 20% of the population being between the ages of 15 and 24, the continent has a growing workforce. And with that prime example for a potential market and economic strength. Think about that. This youthful Africa is happening in juxtaposition with an aging world. It's no surprise that the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, projects that Africa will be the second largest economy within the next few years. That being said, there are some multinational companies and investors that have deemed Africa too risky to be worthy of investment for reasons that have actually resulted in years of donor aid dependency. The, country, the continent has its setbacks. Unlike Asia, Africa doesn't have economic role models until recently. We're starting to see sleeping giants awaken with Rwanda, a landlocked, naturally resource depleted country that went through a genocide, now making major strides in economic transformation by creating a sustaining, a GDP growth rate comparable to that of China and India. The thing is, even government instability has stopped investors in their tracks. Because in Africa, the struggle for democracy has created an economic dimension. Time and time again, when we see leaders abuse power, they end up compromising national prosperity. But countries such as Ethiopia and Uganda are showing that even in the face of political worry, their leaders have been able to stimulate a ethos of economic advancement. The potential, the economic potential of Africa goes beyond that of the scenes of blood diamond and commodity trading. Africa has been able to offer the highest return on foreign direct investment in the world. So you can invest in the oil assets of the north or the diamonds and gold of the south, but don't forget to invest in the innovative ven ventures that are sprouting across the continent in accelerators and incubators. Because in reality, Africa has been investing in the Western world for quite some time, having spent a total of $4 trillion in the international market to date. But now the hard part. How do you and I invest in Africa? There is the way of exchange traded funds and the market vector index of Africa, but there is a more direct, more real way for those of us who operate outside of the business world of stocks and bonds. It's by visiting Africa, by engaging in the local tourism, by enjoying and participating and attaching your own personal value to these 54 countries from the Nile to the Cape. And if you can't take the long flight, you can invest in Africa right here from the US by engaging with African-owned businesses either online or in whatever city you're in. With the growing interconnectedness of our world, I am willing to bet you more than 1,000 Naira that wherever you are, you can find Ethiopian coffee beans, a Senegalese-owned restaurant, or a Kenyan with a tech startup. In the New Haven area alone, there is Lali Bella, an Ethiopian restaurant just off of Temple. There is a Nigerian market off of Whaley Avenue. And right between West Haven and New Haven, there is the headquarters for a Liberian-owned beauty shop in this area alone. 
But the issue is time and time again, Africa has been left out of the loop. It's not been invited to the table. As big businesses and corporations have leveraged and appropriated and stolen African styles to maximize profits, profits that are never realized in the continent, or even worse. They take advantage of lax regulations in these countries and they employ children, forcing them into labor conditions you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy, just to cut costs. This has to stop. In order to fight against these old world views and tactics, we have to come at it with a new world mentality. We have to engage in the dynamic relations that are governing our society. We have to stop perpetuating and fueling a decrepit system in which the Western world is the donor, the savior, and the low income countries are the recipient in need of saving. That system is built for disaster. Africa can no longer be treated as a child waiting for its allowance from the Western world, but rather should be viewed as equals, if not a potential competitor. This is something easily applicable across emerging market countries. Many rife with talent, but constantly, just constantly overlooked. We have to take note of the changes afoot. We have to wake up and we have to shift our perception away from charity and towards partnership. Because then, then we can see the advancement of our global economy and finally the dismantling of a hierarchical system that has forced countries to stay down. In order for us to take and be a part of some of the world's fastest growing economies, we have to rethink our traditional business models so we can encourage social and economic advancement, not only for the African people, but for our global community. Now I have to give credit where credit is due. A lot of what I've spoken about today has been part of my own personal narrative. Sitting on the lap of my father as a, at a very young age, as he talked about theories of change and what Africa could be and should be. It was a huge part of his career, the enhancement of the African landscape. After I lost him a little over a year ago now, I tried as best as I could to pick up where he left off. I mean, he had a PhD and over 40 years of experience, and I'm still struggling for my master's. But it's been his influence and the stories I've picked up along the way that have instilled in me a confidence in knowing that there is no such thing as a low resource country. It's these conversations and the conversations that stem from today that can and will reverberate across borders. It will do away with this old practice of charity and revolutionize the way we look and interact with the world around us. The potential to do so is within you. It's within me. It's within the new generation and the old generation just waiting to be tapped. So don't feel bad for Africa. Believe in Africa. Thank you.